Good day, Mike. First of all, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Happy to do it. Now, that I, I'm, a, I'm a former Hoosier. I know you're a real Hoosier, but you weren't originally a Hoosier, so we'll get into all that in a minute here. But I lived for uh, two and a half years back in the uh, 60s in LaPorte, Indiana, so just north of where you are now in, in uh, Bloomington. But uh, um, And you and I have never really met. I've known of you forever because of our association and our, our in, involvement at NSPI back in the day, uh, the National Society for Performance and Instruction or Program Instruction. Mm -hmm. Improvement. It's had many different names and now it's ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. And I've noticed uh, in my preparation for this that you've done many publications, uh, articles for that organization. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, for our audience, uh, we're going to do a little kind of a five-part introduction here, if you will. But can, you, can we start with, so where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in the wonderful city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, my father worked uh, at Schlitz Brewery. Uh, my mother had uh, a lot of uh, brothers and sisters, and the brothers all worked at breweries. Uh, in fact, I'm very proud of the fact that two of them became vice presidents at Schlitz, and none of them had uh, education beyond the eighth grade. You know, they grew up during the Depression, and uh, they worked their way up from the very, very bottom, from sweeper uh, and chauffeur uh, up to uh, vice presidents and department heads. It's uh, interesting. So uh, where did you go to college and what did you study uh, when you first went off? Well, I, I was lucky enough to go to Marquette University High School, uh, a Jesuit school in Milwaukee for high school. And so I naturally, I never even thought of anything else. Uh, I went to Marquette University. Uh, in fact, <laughs> I, I had thought about applying to Notre Dame because my father's family came from South Bend. So I knew some people there, uh, but then I found out there was a $10 fee for application and I didn't have $10. So I went to Marquette University <laughs> and um, uh, between uh, my, my parents' support and scholarships. And, and I worked full time uh, for a while for, I think in my junior and senior year, I worked full time as an information clerk at the Greyhound bus station in Milwaukee, uh, which was an important, valuable part of my education. Um, it didn't help my grades to be working all day <laughs> and cutting classes. <laughs> But uh, anyway, I, I, I did make it through. I had uh, a major in radio and television. I, <clears throat> I was pretty sure that I, there was no job in commercial radio and television that I was really fit for. Uh, and I was very fortunate to see a flyer one day on a bulletin board announcing National Defense Education Act fellowships, and one was at Syracuse University in educational media. I didn't know what that was, but it sounded like something that could be like radio and television, media, mass media, educational media. So I applied, got the fellowship, um, got a master's degree, and then um, I uh, took a year to work as an intern at the National Education Association in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I can talk more about that later. Came back to Syracuse, finished the uh, doctoral program there. So that was my educational career. Excellent, thank you so much for all of that. That's, that's kind of interesting because I have a radio TV film degree and it was later on as I was getting about a year out from graduation, deciding that I wanted to go into educational TV, but I was gonna to have to transfer to another school and I didn't wanna do that. I was, I, I was too tired of being a poor student and then a poor sailor and then a poor student again. <laughs> I wanted to get a job, but the, and I was told what the, what the salaries were and they weren't all that impressive. But uh, 
But uh, so let's go back then to your internship. So what did you do in that internship? And then we, we can go from there into uh, where you're at now and, and uh, or what you were doing before you retired because you retired here a few years ago. But uh, mm -hmm. so what was that internship all about? Well, I was working in the office of AECT, Association of Educational Communications and Technology, um, <clears throat> which was at that time headed by Anna Heyer. Uh, and I worked uh, partly um, uh, doing what she assigned me to do. And, and half time, uh, I worked with Harold Wigren, who was the educational television consultant uh, for the National Education Association. And so I probably spent more of my time and more of my energy uh, helping uh, Harold, who was a, a honeybee consultant. He spent most of his time on the road picking up ideas about educational television uh, from you know one locale, one station or one university and then carrying it around to others. And he pretty much left me at home to answer his mail. And I literally had a stack of mail like this when I started my internship. And I think it was down to about this a year later. So, uh, but the, the more important part of that internship was that I got to meet national leaders in educational television and audiovisual education. And <clears throat> those connections uh, were the basis for my lifelong career network. Uh, I mean, I was able to advance further, faster than most people because I was known to uh, people who mattered. Uh, in fact, um, I got my first job through a connection from that internship. Uh, we went to the group of us, the group of interns, it was a Ford Foundation program and there were a half dozen or a dozen of us in the program at the same time. And we went together to the annual convention of the American Association of School Administrators. And unbeknownst to me, that was a gathering place for deans of schools of education. And so at a cocktail party, I was rubbing elbows with some deans uh, I was there for the refreshments, but <laughs> I was chatting with Deans and, and one of them I got into a deeper conversation with. And he said, Mike, when you finish your degree at Syracuse, let me know, I'd like to hire you at University of North Carolina at Greensboro. <laughs> the, uh, I, this kills people who are out there now in the job market striving. I was invited to apply for a position. And so when I did finish, I did contact him, I did get the job. And so I started my career as, um, well, I was overseeing the building of the media center and, and I was building the curriculum in audiovisual education. Uh, and so this was my on the job training. Uh, I learned about media center administration by having to do it I had never had a course in it. And I learned how to teach. I mean, I developed courses all across the curriculum, hardly any of which I had ever taken somewhere else. So as I said, that was my, that was my real graduate education, UNCG. For our audience, I think they're gonna understand what educational television is all about, but uh, what's this AV thing, this audiovisual thing? Uh, uh, how would you uh, define that for our uh, yeah. younger audiences that we may have? Well, it, it was a, a hot area in the 1960s, thanks to Sputnik in the late 50s. Um, there was a, a feeling that the United States was lagging behind the Soviet Union in science, engineering, and technology. And one of the areas that uh, sort of tagged along uh, was the uh, technological devices used in education. Uh, that's why my fellowship came under the National Defense Education Act. They were giving money for scholarships because it 
was perceived as being directly connected to the national defense. We had to catch up with the Russians. So uh, in those days, audiovisual education was mainly about the use of electrical and mechanical devices, um, including television, but, we, but that was someone else's turf and we just overlapped with them. We didn't control it. The turf that we controlled was uh, film uh, in, in, as used in schools, uh, film libraries, uh, film strips, overhead projection, um, and then later programmed instruction for a very interesting reason. <laughs> programmed instruction came into the world of education by way of teaching machines, okay? And when schools started acquiring teaching machines to experiment with programmed instruction, um, someone, <laughs> someone had to carry the machines around and maintain them if they stopped working and put, put them on carts and push them up and down the hallways and get them to where they were scheduled to be used. Well, that's what the AV guy did. <laughs> He, he was often also the football coach you know, <laughs> or the band director, but he was, it was almost always a male and someone who was strong enough to lift movie projectors and uh, push carts around, sometimes over curbs, you know, so you have to be very big and strong. Uh, and that's how teaching machines came into the audiovisual world. And once that happened, we had to figure out what in the heck these things were all about. And we had to study behavioral psychology. I never had it in college, but I, I got an on the job training in behavioral psychology, uh, keeping up with the literature on programmed instruction uh, because I had to teach about it. So I better learn about it. And of course uh, that uh, eventually became the central focus of the field, uh, the, the psychological uh, manipulations uh, that are done in a planful way as opposed to just the mechanical devices. Yes, I was watching a video of you last night as I, I talked a little bit about before we started recording, and you talked about programmed instruction and its roots in the, uh, with Skinner, and you took some exception to what uh, programmed instruction where it kind of fell short but uh, can you go back a little bit and explain to our audience so what exactly is a teaching machine? How did it work? And what was its uh, connection with programmed instruction? Okay, uh, program, programmed instruction was an idea that <clears throat> learning happened only when organisms did something and that something was followed by a reinforcer. Well, if that was true, then uh, in education, we would be much more efficient and effective if we had the learner spending more time doing things, preferably correct, you know, making correct responses so that you could follow those responses with a reinforcer. Now, Skinner's breakthrough as far as practicality came when he decided that knowledge of correct results was a reinforcer. So if you ask the learner a question, they gave the right answer, you confirmed it, or you corrected it. Uh, <clears throat> and this, this uh, routine was uh, put into a series of items which were called frames. Uh, and they were uh, originally, uh, in Skinner's mind, uh, best delivered through a device uh, it was a, a box that had a window in it. And in the window, you saw one frame of information and there was a question and you either press the button, you know, one, two, three, four, multiple choice, or you wrote on a little um, paper scroll next to the frame, you wrote your answer, you turned a crank or you pressed a button and it, it electrically covered up what you had written so you couldn't change it and showed you the correct response. And so all of these operations were considered crucial by B.F. Skinner, who in, invented behavioral psychology and invented the teaching routine. Um, 
Uh, it was later found that students did just as well if you put the frames and uh, arrange them on a page in a book and they turn the page to see the correct answer. Yep. Um, and so they didn't need the machines, but at first the machines were the magical thing. Um, and it really captured the public imagination. It was in Life Magazine and Time Magazine and on you know news programs and in popular movies. Uh, this, new, this magical device that helped people learn faster, better, and cheaper because you didn't need teachers. Um, and, and so programmed instruction was a very, very important breakthrough in that it demonstrated the possibility of self-instruction without the direct intermediation of a human. Uh, it showed it could be done. However, the, the failure was back at the very beginning when Skinner decided that knowledge of correct results was a universal reinforcer. You know, reinforcement theory only works if the organism is getting something that is reinforcing. And when a pigeon is stuffed full of corn, corn is no longer reinforcing. When a learner has gotten 20 answers in a row correct, they're bored. They don't care what the correct answer is. You know, it becomes a mechanical task and they lose motivation. Uh, so knowledge of correct results turned out not to be a universal reinforcer, although it was pretty good. It was the next thing, you know, next best thing to it but it, it really didn't have magical properties. It turns out the magic was in breaking down the instructional material into units, into frames, uh, forcing the designer to think through the sequencing of the ideas uh, and, and to prompt the learner to do something. So that kind of active participation in a well-structured lesson, that worked. Uh, and, and that's what got incorporated in the whole idea of, of instructional design. Thank you. Thank you for uh, taking us back there into that, into that history. What are the parallels to e-learning from teaching machines that you see? And where have we done well with uh, using that machine? Um, and where have we uh, maybe gone off the track? Of course, e-learning means so many different things. Okay. Um, you know, it could mean any kind of learning that is done in association with an electronic device or electrical device, as far as that goes. So it would incorporate the old teaching machines. Um, and there have been people who started off in those old days, educational researchers, who continued to develop more and more sophisticated uh, computer-assisted teaching machines. And the goal has always been to uh, be able to anticipate the learner's pattern of errors and give them just the help they needed uh, to overcome their personal um, difficulties, their personal hurdles, uh, and to, you know, do away with the chaff and, and just get to the, the kernel. Um, but that still isn't uh, what they call intelligent tutoring systems are still a very minor player. Uh, they're very, very expensive. Uh, they fill only a niche market. They're just a few specific subjects uh, for which they, they've been you know, fully developed and fully, let's say, uh, responsive to different kinds of errors. Um, so that has not yet turned out to be uh, a, a magical device. Now, the other major manifestation is web-based. Uh, so anything on a screen uh, would be e-learning. And what all of these have in common is the American fascination with devices, uh, that tools and technologies are solutions to our problems. Um, and you may re recall back, oh, in the 70s, 
uh, people uh, I know at AECT conventions, uh, you would see them wearing a little badge that says, technology is the answer. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> And that, that is, that's the fallacy. We always think that the magic is in the device and it's never in the device. It's in the psychology, the, you know, the learning psychology uh, that is uh, activated within the device. And the cleverer the uh, psychological uh, intervention, the more successful <laughs> the, the device. Uh, but most people, don't see it that way. They just think that if you shovel a college course onto, you know, PowerPoint slides and and you know and 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 transmit it over a satellite, it's it much must be much better than a lecture, and it's not. One of the uh, issues that I recall from my days early on in uh, at NSPI back in 1979 when I joined was this uh, the issue of short frames and long frames. So uh, can you share with us a little bit about what the advantage of a short versus a long frame might be or vice versa? Well, as, as I was saying, it, it turned out that the magic was not in the reinforcement or in the, uh, 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 not in the um, provision of correct results, Mm -hmm. uh, but the magic was in the shaping of the material. And so there's some material uh, that is better put into larger chunks um, uh, where adjacent concepts can be talked about at the same time, uh, rather than just having a string of sentences, each of which talks about two concepts and the connection between them. And so you go from one to the next to the next. Sometimes it's better to think of the uh, of a whole. And in fact, that reminds me of um, um, Charlie Rigaluth's uh, simplifying condition method. There are a lot of cognitive tasks that are better, especially problem solving or troubleshooting types of tasks that are better seen as a whole right from the beginning. And you begin as he would say, with an epitome, you take the simplest case, but it has all of the elements uh, just in their clearest, simplest condition. You present that first and have the learner master those relationships. Then you give them a, a trickier problem where the variables are a little bit more um, challenging. And then step by step, you, you let them progress, make mistakes, learn from their mistakes and so on. Um, so those would be, that would be kind of a larger frame uh, approach as opposed to just a series of discrete messages. That, cause that always makes me, every time I hear the term micro learning, I always think of that short frame versus the long frame and there's an appropriate time and a place for both, but micro learning is not the savior for uh, learning and development, as it's now known, what used to be called training and development, what was called uh, instructional design or instructional development or ISD or uh, all the various names that we've had for these things. But uh, thank you for that. So uh, one of the things I heard in that video that I, I watched last night was uh, you talking about the work of Dick Clark and uh, about media and Dick Clark is a, I'm a big fan of Dick Clark's and, uh, and so that I really, that caught my uh, mind in terms of whether it was media versus method. And you talked about uh, 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 a typology and I think that's maybe related to a book that you put out or an article that you, you maybe have written. So I'd like to explore a little bit about that, but uh, so I believe that uh, if I could paraphrase what uh, Dick Clark said in this article, I believe it goes back to 1983, is that uh, um, the, the media that we use is no different than if your groceries came to you in a truck or a car or something along those lines. And it had less to do with media than the methods that we employ as we design and develop instruction. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, he, he came up with, uh, I think, a better analogy um, or maybe I did, 
but he and I were traveling around Spain in the late 80s. We were invited to give a series of lectures at Spanish universities. And so we traveled together for a couple of weeks. And so we had a lot of time to uh, talk to each other as well as listen to each other lecture. And um, the analogy uh, that came out of uh, that was um, uh, Pepto-Bismol. Uh, you know, I, I would say in, in my lectures, I, I would hold up um, a bottle of Pepto-Bismol and some Pepto-Bismol tablets. And I say, you know, when you travel, one of the greatest um, uh, drawbacks is the chance of getting travelers dysentery. And it turns out that Pepto-Bismol is a good cure for travelers dysentery. Now you can take it in a bottle or you can take it in these tablets. Um, both of them are effective because both of them have the same active ingredient, which is bismuth. The act, so the active ingredient is what cures the ill, not the delivery system. Uh, and the, the liquid Pepto-Bismol comes in a heavy glass bottle and it has water in it. So it's heavier to carry around. As a traveler, I prefer to carry the tablets. Uh, I chew them and I drink my water. I don't carry the water with me. So it's a more efficient uh, delivery system for the active ingredient. And so that's the way to think about media. Um, you, 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 you know, maybe radio or television or film uh, or an overhead projector or a, a whiteboard or a computer screen may be the more efficient delivery system for that specific situation. You know, it depends on production time, production costs, uh, you know, cost of leasing satellite time. And, you know, all, there are all kinds of costs involved with different media delivery systems, even printing a book, you know, the, the cost of printing, you're, you're setting the type and printing the pages and shipping the books around to the learners. Every media system has costs associated and benefits. Uh, certain things you can do with a book, you can't do with a film. Some things you can do with a film, you can't do with a book. Uh, so you, you pick the delivery system that has the combination of auditory, visual, participatory affordances uh, that you want for your bit of uh, education. Thank you. Thank you for that. And for our audience, they should know that uh, we are seeing on the uh, peripheries of the screen one of your three cats <laughs> who have come to visit. Uh, so they're, they're adding some entertainment here and some distraction, perhaps. Um, let me shift gears a little bit here to uh, an article that you wrote. I'm not sure exactly when you wrote it, but I've been, uh, I've heard about it more recently. Uh, I heard about it in the past, but more recently, Alex Salas, a good friend of mine, was chasing down, you know, so where did Addy come from? And you've written about the elusive Addy model. <laughs> We're looking uh, at, in a book that uh, was put out by NSPI, which was the Introduction to Performance Technology. And this is from the uh, um, 1983, I believe. Um, and, it, and in it, Joe Harless talks about analysis, design, development, implementation, evaluation. Now, he never used the ADDIE acronym, but he put, put out the words. But I believe that when in 1979, when I joined the field, people were talking about ADDIE you know, as an acronym standing for those, those, those five words. So, but you've chased it down and you spent some time and effort trying to figure out, well, where the heck did this come from? So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the, the ironic thing is that article that uh, I wrote uh, for, was it, I think it was for um, performance, you know, uh, performance and instruction, mm -hmm. the uh, ISPI publication. Um, I, uh, my research uh, article uh, consisted of about 15 telephone calls uh, one day, uh, calling uh, elders in the field and asking them when they first heard the term Addy and where did they think it came from. The most, the most popular response was, well, 
you invented it, didn't you? <laughs> and, and no, I, I didn't. Uh, so what, what I concluded from my deep research was that, you know, and, and of course I've been in, I've been reading the literature since there was a field. I mean, the field began really, well, I don't want to get into the whole history. The, the most visible manifestation of what became instructional design uh, started in the early 60s. Uh, and, and it came, came through military, um, man-machine problem uh, research. But um, it, it, so I've been reading that literature since I was in graduate school at the time, reading all of those early papers. And I've read, you know, subscribed to all the best journals and read all the articles since then. And I had never come across the term Addy uh, in any of these books or, or journals. Now, as you say, Joe Harless and others uh, were talking about instructional design. And when they talked about uh, the steps or the major phases of instructional design projects, they often used terms like analysis, design, development, and so on. But uh, there was never, there was never an, uh, uh, public, a, a publicly announced uh, visual verbal model that was called the Addy model. Um, but, uh, much later in the 80s, I think I, I, I cited in that article, uh, there was a, um, a monograph put out by ASTD uh, that showed a, a five boxes with arrows between them. Uh, and, and it said, this is the Addy model. Uh, that was the first and, and original uh, rendition of the model. Uh, but as you say, what I discovered in my research was that a lot of people were using the term Addy back in the 80s uh, to describe models, visual verbal models of this sort, uh, of the sort that showed steps in the process, either a circular process or like in a square or rectangular or whatever. Um, people trying to put down on paper in a shorthand way, what um, were the important uh, elements of this process. And, and so to talk about this family of models, which were basically very similar uh, they said, well, you know, it, it, it's sort of, it's an Addy type model. And that's where the term came from. And yet it, it's been interesting to me. Well, for the, I was going to say the ironic thing is that little article, which took one day to prepare, is my most cited work of all, my whole career. <laughs> and, it's, and I'm sure it is usually cited incorrectly in that I am the author of the Addy model, or I'm advocating the Addy model, or I'm proving that Addy model exists. I was trying to prove that it doesn't exist. <laughs> and, and I was driven to it because I was involved in an argument with two guys who were doing a, a periodical publication on models in instructional development. And they were arguing about what were the correct steps in the Addy model. I was like, there is no Addy model. There is no orthodox version. There is no canonical version uh, of the Addy model. So I, I did my research and published it in order to put that myth to rest. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for that story. That's interesting. You've also been uh, someone who has addressed and the article title that I got off the web yesterday was the mythical retention chart and the corruption of Dale's cone of experience. Um, now, this is something that just won't go away. Dale's cone with the numbers associated with it. And so, but I'll let you explain, you know, your involvement in trying to dispel that, uh, that corruption. I, uh, I was working on this problem for years and having trouble figuring out how to put it all into print. And I finally decided to collaborate with Will Talheimer, whose work you may know. 
mm -hmm. especially if you're uh, a fan of evidence-based solutions. Um, uh, Deepak Subramoni, who had been a student of mine at Indiana, and he had written a rather uh, prescient uh, paper about the original Dale's Cone, and Tony Beatrice uh, at SUNY Potsdam, uh, who had also done um, a lot of uh, tracking down of that retention chart, the figures in the retention chart. And so we finally decided to pool all our efforts rather than citing each other's work and try getting all tangled up in that, um, we would co-author a series of, oh, there were about five or six articles that were bound together in a special issue of Educational Technology Magazine. And that the entire run of that magazine, as you know, it's, it, it died when Larry Lipsitz, the publisher died a few years ago. Uh, but all issues of that journal, which were paper only, have been digitized and are available for free uh, if you, well, if you have access to JSTOR, J-S-T-O-R, which is a common um, aggregator of research uh, papers uh, and, and all college libraries subscribe to it. Uh, in any event, you, you can get uh, this special issue for free and you'll see that we have a series of articles in which we track down the the actual people whose names have been associated with this conglomeration of the cone and the retention figures uh, that it's been attributed to various people uh, all erroneously and we will go into detail who was this person actually what did they actually publish and why was their name dragged into this mess <laughs> erroneously um, so what um, uh, and, and by the way, we were parallel to this. There was a, a, a doctoral student in Norway, I believe, who was doing a dissertation on the retention chart. And we were, he was a little bit close fisted with his data, uh, but we did exchange some ideas on who had found the earliest reference to this idea that people retain, you know, 10% of what they read and you know five percent of what they hear and so on uh and he had tr tracked it down further than we had we had tracked it down to a university of wisconsin extension agricultural extension pamphlet that came out about 1910 uh where some were these figures uh very close to the uh current uh, canonical version uh, where these were announced. Um, and, but he found some in Europe going back into the 1800s. So it's part of the folklore of education, really, in Europe and in America. Uh, and of course, it's completely meaningless. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> in order to make sense of the statement, you know, people remember 90% of this, 80% of that, you'd have to know what the knowledge, skill, or attitude being taught is, uh, how you would test the uh, retention of it, and whether it would be short-term or long-term retention, et cetera, et cetera. There's no way to make generalizations about what people remember based on the delivery system that brought them the information. So that's the short answer to your question, but we managed to fill up a whole magazine <laughs> with all of the uh, nuances of that argument. We, well, it's, it's the retention data that's uh, suspect, right, and, and incorrect, but what about da the Dale's Cone? Can you speak a little well, bit on that? Dale's Cone was nothing but uh, a visual device uh, that he used to help sell his textbook. Um, the um, the chapters of the textbook dealt with you know different um, classifications of learning experiences uh, from you know direct hands-on type of materials to uh, you know audiovisual still pictures moving pictures and he 
he was affected by some earlier, an earlier textbook that he was competing with uh, that had used a, a kind of a, a, a scale, a gradated scale to show that as the amount of information uh, was subtracted, uh, the message becomes you know, less concrete and more abstract. Um, and that, that's all it was to show the concreteness of the experience. And it was a very rough categorization. And, and it, hadn't, it was only meant to be descriptive, to talk about how you can agglomerate um, you know, different media. You, you could say uh, uh, a still picture projected on the screen uh, from a slide projector or an overhead projector or a film strip projector you know, could be spoken of as, as one kind of media experience. So it was a way of clustering together things that were similar. That's all it was. And it was certainly not meant, or Dale said, it was not meant to imply that experiences at the bottom of the scale were superior to those at the top of the scale, because there are things at the top of the scale, verbal information that can only be learned through verbal transmission. You can't, you know, watch a film uh, to um, uh, learn uh, the basic uh, basic concepts of psychology. Uh, the names of these concepts—you have to see the names and hear the names. Uh, so it, it was purely meant to be a descriptive classification system, uh, but people uh, wanted to take it as a, a prescriptive guide, and that you, the the closer the experiences were to direct um, uh, involvement with real uh, materials, real objects, reality, uh, the better it was. And, and certainly there, there is a, and, and Dale said this, there is a value in having these concrete experiences to give the verbal experiences meaning uh, and substance. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, little children are probably better introduced to abstract ideas uh, by giving them concrete uh, experiences with those ideas. Let them feel a triangle, you know, let them manipulate, you know, flannel uh, circles and, and, and rectangles and put them on a, a flannel board uh, in order to get the feel of, uh, of the different shapes. But eventually they have to know the names of these shapes and that goes to the top of the pyramid. Well, thank you for that. And, and how does this relate then to, I think you said in the video that I watched, it was a 2013 video, you talked about typologies and that you had, uh, th this is something that came from Gagne and he had six and now you have 12 different teaching, learning configurations, I believe was the phrase that you used. Um, Tell us where you've taken that and uh, where people can learn yeah. about that. Well, this is one of the major ideas of the book that was just published this year, The Elements of Instruction. Um, this is something I had been laboring over for three, four years. Uh, I, had, I was past my deadline from the publisher. And so I recruited a co-author Deepak Subramoni, with whom I collaborated on the Dales Cone business. I knew we worked well together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew he was highly motivated uh, to bring this to completion. And so uh, we, I lashed myself to him <laughs> and got the book done. Um, but the book um, uh, is a result of my dissatisfaction with the concept of instructional methods uh, that um, this term is used uh, uh, quite randomly uh, in the field of pedagogy and uh, no two authors use the word with exactly the same meaning and in fact um, you, you referenced uh, de Clark and the media methods debate with uh, Robert Kozma back in the 90s um, and I followed that debate very closely and I, I didn't see it as clearly at the time. Something was bothering me 
uh, that I, I felt I couldn't quite get my hands around either person's arguments in a sufficiently concrete way to make a judgment. And I finally realized, and this is, it took me years of scratching my head to, to finally realize that the problem was neither Clark nor Kozma had ever um, committed himself to a specific definition of either medium or method. So they both, so Kozma could use Clark's characterization of media against him by twisting it into his own meaning and vice versa. Uh, so they were really, um, uh, you know, they, they were really at cross purposes because they weren't talking about the same thing. And that's what kept the argument going because once you're both talking about the same thing and you're looking at the same data, you'll probably come to the same conclusion. <laughs> Uh, but they were looking at it from you know different frames. So uh, over the years, I have had you know kind of insights into this, and I would bounce them off to Clark through email. So it might be three years between our conversations, so we'd have to catch up. Uh, but we have kept in constant communication since the '90s, and I would check my ideas with him, and as reluctant as he was to admit that he had failed to define these terms, he, I, I think he, if he sees this, I think he will um, agree that we, we have agreed uh, on, this, um, uh, on this issue. And uh, he largely accepts my current definitions. And let me give my, my, my definition of method. Um, Let's see, I've got it here in my notes. An instructional method is a generalized pattern of activities. So it's something that can be uh, replicated by other people. It's a generalizable pattern that affords learners the opportunity to exercise the cognitive and or motor and emotional processes necessary to achieve some instructed learning objective. So a method is a pattern of activities that gives learners the opportunity to practice mental skills, physical skills. Uh, and, and in the very latest rendition, I added emotional processes because and we may come back to this later, uh, my current lifelong learning project uh, is a neuroscience. And what we now understand just in the past couple of years is that all cognitive processes and all motor processes have emotional correlates. Uh, so those parts of the brain are interconnected. So that's it, you know, it, it, so a method is a pattern of activities that fulfills certain learning requirements. Um, and having thought that through, I, I then was trying to get down to the basic elements of the instructional process, um, the learner, the facilitator, the resources, the setting, um, these are things you can see. You can take a photograph of a classroom or a training center and you can see a learner, a facilitator, <laughs> a setting. <laughs> um, and the, 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 the magical component, the part I'm most interested in, the communication configuration. That's the term I'm using now. And I have, I have refined my list to eight communication configurations. I'm saying that any snapshot you take of any instructional situation uh, will show the learners, facilitators, and resources arranged in one of these eight communication patterns. 
Uh, and they are briefly presentation, demonstration, large group discussion, small group discussion, um, tutorial, repetition, or practice. I avoided the term practice because practice is part of other, or doing practice is part of many of these configurations. Uh, but repetition is the key idea. They're repeating uh, a skill or subskill until it's mastered. Study, which is in an individual with a book or a teaching machine, and expression. Um, and study and expression are, and even repetition, uh, are hardly covered in the textbooks on instructional design. Uh, no one ever talks about these. Uh, even in teacher education courses, textbooks are hardly mentioned. They're not mentioned at all, uh, you know, to be practically speaking. And yet, probably 80% of what students retain from a high school course is what they read in the damn textbook. <laughs> And the night before the exam, they're studying the textbook. And if the if the test questions don't come from the textbooks, they're up in arms. They hang the teacher. <laughs> so uh, a study that one to one uh, wrestling with resources, uh, whether they're audiovisual or print or you know what have you, that one to one encounter uh, is, is study. And the other, you know, if that's 80%, the other 20% of the learning comes from expression. That is writing the damn term paper. <laughs> uh, this is where your thoughts come together. You, uh, where your understanding of the subject is put into your own words. You don't really understand a concept until you can explain it to someone else. And that's what expression is. It's that written or let's say it, it could be in the case of an artist, it could be painted, it could be sculpted, it could be danced, it could be sung, it could be played on a musical instrument, but it is a, a, a piece of your expression showing your understanding of the mastery of some skill or concept. Uh, and again, like I, I mentioned music, dance, art, like these aren't even talked about in the instructional design literature. They don't really cover a very broad range of human instructed learning activities, among other things. So uh, that's what I'm that's what I'm selling in the book. Um, uh, there are some other very important pieces to it. Uh, but uh, the most practical portion is the um, series of chapters one on each of those configurations, where they came from, what they consist of, and how they can be used, how they fit different kinds of um, learning objectives. Well, thank you for that. Now, I, I, I'll i be uh, putting a blog post together, and I've got that book and uh, where it can be bought. It, it was it's available in lots of different places, and I've got an Amazon link in there, and I'll be sure to include that the link to the Amazon because the book just came out in October of uh, 2020, uh, just last uh, fall, and uh, but, but uh, so I, I would encourage others to to take a look at this because I think it's it's very interesting and I've already ordered it. So, but I haven't looked at it yet. So I, my apologies for for not being totally prepared uh, to ask any probing questions on that. But I hope to do another video with you in a different video series and, and focus in on that book so people will understand what's the value proposition of this and how I might use this in my practices in instructional design or learning. I look forward to that. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's shift gears here a little bit now again back to uh, my series of questions. So my series here is titled a uh, human performance technology video uh, series. So HPT, um, it's been called many things over the years, performance technology, performance improvement, human performance improvement, which is the words that ASDD, now ATD, had uh, begun to use, I think back in the 90s, uh, kind of in competition with, uh, with ISPI. Uh, and as Tiagi once said to me in a video that I did with him either in 2008 or 2009, 
I don't know why we're calling it human performance technology. We used to just call it performance improvement. So the names have been all over the place yet. But so what I'd like to shift gears here and talk about now is so where did you first come across this notion given many different names? Uh, it, I, it also could be evidence-based practices for performance improvement. So it's it includes instruction, but it could be beyond instruction. Can you share with us a little bit about your first uh, exposure to this and 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 some of the uh, uh, people or books or articles that we can point our audience to that, that from your early days, not necessarily more recent. Yeah, uh, I, I can remember quite uh, vividly uh, my first encounter with this construct. Uh, it was, uh, <clears throat> I think, around 1971, uh, Joe Harless was interviewed, and I think it was in Training Magazine. You may know, Guy, you can correct me, but I think it was Training Magazine. And uh, the interview, I think, was titled um, Front End Analysis, because that was the big new idea. It was about a lot of things, uh, but the big new idea that Joe Harless was uh, selling at that time in the early 70s was front end analysis. And <clears throat> it immediately caught my attention because the point of front end analysis was to do a kind of performance analysis to separate non-instructional problems from instructional problems, things that you couldn't cure with training versus things you could. Uh, and like most educators, it had never occurred to me that there are other solutions to human performance deficiencies other than training or education. Uh, so that hit me hard. And it made me immediately incorporate that idea in my teaching about instructional design. I said, before you waste a lot of time and effort designing instruction, make sure that instruction is the problem. <laughs> make sure that ignorance is the problem. Uh, ignorance, you is not usually the problem. <laughs> Motivation is more likely, or lack of tools and so on, uh, is more likely the problem. That's what I learned from Joe Harless. Uh, I later had a chance to hear him speak at an NSPI convention uh, where he elaborated more fully on his growing ideas about HPT. I think he, he was using that term or PT in those days. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's not the part of performance and instruction, which th that was the name of ISPI at one time, International Society for Performance and Instruction. I have always clung to that instruction part. Uh, that's the part that I consider myself an expert in. And the, there are so many other performance interventions each of which has a specialty, each of which has a, a vocational specialization, you know, organizational psychologist and, and ergonomic uh, specialist and so on. I leave those to those specialists. Now, what the, what the consultant should know is enough about instruction and enough about motivation, enough about ergonomics uh, to be able to help the client put together the right team to solve the problem. Uh, and, and most of those other people, the ergonomics guy or the, uh, uh, the um, co cognitive uh, assisting, uh, you know, the tools guy probably don't see the big picture. <laughs> and so you're the one who sees the big picture. And, and I, I honor that. And, and that's why I've always taught it. Uh, even though I, I never taught PT, I taught instructional design, but I taught it as a component of PT or performance improvement. Uh, the goal is that, you know, in, in schools, we only have one kind of performance intervention or one primary kind, uh, and that's instruction. But in the workplace, there are many other possible interventions. And so please remember that and be a good team member. That, that's in a nutshell what I what I like you know what I preach to my students. Well, this is just this this conversation here has just uh, brought me to the point that we didn't 
leave uh, your time at uh, the University of North Carolina and, and and go to Indiana, where you where you spent a good chunk of your career here. So let's let's back up a little bit and go to. So how did you leave North Carolina and go to Indiana? What was that? Well, that's an interesting story. Um, I um, I promised my wife at the time um, that we would. Um, stay in that region because she was from that region herself, uh, Southern Virginia, uh, unless there was you know, some unusual opportunity came along and you know, we'd look at it skeptically. Um, but uh, at an um, AECT, then DAVI, uh, Department of Audiovisual Instruction originally, at one of their conventions, um, I, um, I ran into Bob Hynek, who was then the guru at Indiana University. And he mentioned that they had a search going on for someone who would be part-time instructional development and part-time teaching. And it didn't sound very interesting to me because I didn't know anything about instructional development. That was still a new and emerging field. I wasn't teaching about it yet. I was barely, barely reading about it. And uh, so I said, no, I, I don't think I'd be interested in that. Um, but then later in the convention, I ran to Mendel Sherman, who was chairman of that department, the Instructional Systems Technology at Indiana. And he described to me a faculty position uh, that sounded very well suited to my interest. And so I went to campus to interview and uh, along the way, I ran to Heineck. He said, what the hell are you doing here? Yeah. He said, you told me you, did, you weren't interested in this job. I said, are you talking about the same job that Mendel Sherman is talking about? <laughs> he sold it a completely different way. <laughs> so that's how I got that. And I eventually you know, um, decided to go there, I convinced my wife to give it a shot. And um, uh, found that um, uh, working alongside Bob and then more importantly, alongside, alongside some very talented graduate students, I learned how to be an instructional development um, uh, consultant or, uh, or helper. Uh, so again, thanks to those graduate students, I learned from them. And in fact, when Heineck stepped down from directing this instructional development center. He wanted me to become the director. I said, no, I'll only do it if I can be co-director with Amos Patterson, one of the students. And they said, okay, it was unusual, unorthodox, but it was okay. And so I learned how to be uh, an instructional development manager from Amos Patterson. <laughs> so uh, that's how I got to Indiana. Uh, at Indiana, I was primarily uh, at first working in audiovisual education. And um, <clears throat> Bob Heineck, um, back in the late 70s, had a contract with a publisher to do a book on audiovisual methods. Uh, but he was having trouble getting traction. So he asked me if I would co-author. And we found out that uh, a friend of ours at Purdue, James Russell, um, was also negotiating with a publisher to do a, a book. So I suggested the three of us get together, go to a different publisher <laughs> uh, and, and, and do a better book than any of us could do individually. Um, and we did do the book, came out in 1982, Instructional Media and the New Technologies of Instruction. Uh, it immediately I mean, in its first year, uh, it outsold all of the previous textbooks uh, in the first year. And by the second or third year, they were off the market. So this was the most used, most adopted textbook in the field of instructional media forever. Uh, it's now in its 12th edition. Uh, I'm no longer on the team, uh, but uh, in, in the content, content has you know revolved considerably but um, 
uh, that was that was my focus originally how to use how to incorporate audiovisual materials uh, into lesson plans um, along the way mainly through my other hat doing instructional development i began to learn what that was about and in 1976 i believe i taught the first course at indiana university on instructional development and that became my main teaching focus for the next 20 or so years um, i did I, I i was interested in simulation gaming so i i taught some special topic seminars and eventually some permanent courses and i was interested in distance education well i was <laughs> I was coerced into doing distance education. Um, in the mid 80s, I was chairman of the department and we had a problem. We had regional campuses of Indiana University that were offering degrees in instructional media, instructional technology uh, and offering, because it's a, this university has supposedly has a you know, system, an integrated system. They were using the same course numbers, the same course names, but they're being taught by, you know, a variety of adjunct professors and, uh, and part-timers and people borrowed from vocational education or art education. Um, and, and the instructional development part just wasn't being taught or wasn't being taught well. And those students were having trouble putting together enough courses to finish a degree. Well, as chairman at Bloomington, this was my problem, <laughs> and I tried to get um, I tried to get someone to um, teach the course on the state television system, which was a, a big and prominent thing at that time. The Indiana Higher Education Telecommunication System. Uh, it was a, a a linked, you know, satellite and and land. Um, based uh, uh, interconnected system that connected all the regional campuses with a big studio radio television uh, center in, in Bloomington. Um, and no one else would do it. So I said, well, I've got to solve the problem. So I'll teach the damn course. Uh, I, after all, I have a degree in radio and television. I should know how to do this. Uh, so I did. And, and for, oh, five or six years, uh, I taught, uh, I think it was twice a week, uh, all, uh, evening classes on the, on the state system. And I learned a lot about packaging what I had been doing in the classroom and uh, repackaging it for this kind of system where it was mainly remote learners but we always had some kind of audio feedback. It varied from year to year, um, whether it was a live mic that was open all the time or a mic that was, was activated when they raised their hand and so on. Uh, but it was a, a laborious um, uh, system because I had my own live class sitting in the studio Mm. Then I had the remote students. And what I learned from the feedback at the end of the semester was if I looked into the camera most of the time, the students in person say, who are we? Why are you ignoring us? You know, I am com completely demotivated. It's like we don't exist. Who We're paying the same tuition they are, and you're only teaching to them. I mean, this is too, too loud and clear. So I spent more time looking into the eyes of the students who were on the other side of the camera. And the remote student says, what the hell is going on? Aren't we part of this class too? You never talked to us. <laughs> so I really had to walk a fine line in dividing my gaze between the camera and the class. And I kept restaging it so the class was closer and closer to the camera. <laughs> so I did that. Uh, split my attention so much. 
but I, thus I became an expert in distance education. And that became a topic that I taught and wrote about in the later part of my career. Now the program at Indiana, I, I believe is called instructional um, education. Is it instruction? Instructional Technologies systems. In it. Instructional systems technology. Now, so my question is, is that the word technology, I think has been used with different meanings over, over the decades here that I've been involved in this. And I think Dick Clark is the one who, who said to me at one time back in the, probably the mid nineties, that technology is the application of science. And that's what HPT is. It's the application of science for performance improvement. So whereas ASTD, ATD is talking about human performance improvement, well, that's the end goal, but how do you get there? What are the means to those ends? And HPT, human performance technology, the application of science will get you to that goal. But, in, but at Indiana University, is technology referring to hardware and then software kinds of things, or is it really about the science of instruction? It really was science, uh, very clearly. Um, it was the, uh, uh, the brainchild, really, of Ole Larson, uh, the guy who founded the Audiovisual Center, uh, who was always a, a big picture thinker uh, and who uh, early caught on to this idea of the systems approach. And so uh, in his mind, uh, technology was a name to describe the systems approach. Um, you know, applying scientific methods to practical affairs. And he tried to reorganize the audiovisual center uh, along these uh, different, you know, sy systemic uh, elements, you know, the analysis part, uh, the design part, the development part, the evaluation part. He actually made those departments within this, what was a large kingdom, the audiovisual center. Um, by the way, there, there's a story that I'll tell very briefly of how that empire came to be. Uh, Ole came on board in 1940 uh, with a dream of creating a large audiovisual center. Uh, World War II intervened and he uh, put his dream on hold. But during the war, both he and the president of the university, uh, Herman B. Wells, uh, were working part-time in the war effort. They were both commuting once a week uh, for a couple of days a week to Washington, D.C. to work mainly in educational film, training film and propaganda film projects. Uh, and Ole made it a point to check with President Wells, the secretary, to know his train schedule. So he made sure he got in the same train as Herman, and so he would sit with Herman in, all night in the smoker um, talking his big ideas. And, and Herman was sold on the, the concept that uh, Ole was selling. And his, the basic concept was, we can build a world-class audiovisual center if you will support us, give us some seed money to buy filmmaking equipment and facilities and studios we will make films and we will repurpose film. We'll take you know, military training films, uh, industrial training films that are made during the war. We'll acquire those, put them in a library, supplement it with films that we make for college courses. We'll rent these out and sell them. We'll sell ours and rent the others. And we can build uh, you know, a research component and a production component if you let us keep the revenues from the film rentals and the film sales. And Herman agreed to that. So this is the only place in the country, it's a unique story, maybe in the history of academia, where a service agency became an academic department because they were able to keep the revenue that was generated, the external revenue that was generated by the service agency. Uh, it was the film library that built in, that built the instructional system technology program. So Ole was very influential. Uh, he was about to retire at the time they were changing the name, and he wanted to be sure that his 
ideas about systems were incorporated in the name. Bob Hynek was coming in as the guru who had made his reputation on the term instructional technology. So between the two of them, they convinced the faculty to embrace this term uh, to cover all the bases. And the term has lasted. We're one of the few departments. We're the only one that took that exact name. And maybe we're among the few that is left standing with a name like that. Uh, others have been merged and combined and disappeared. Uh, but we're IST is still up and going at Indiana. And wasn't the program at Indiana one of the first in the country to, to offer well, it, pro yeah, it was it was the first to go big. Okay. It was the first to uh, offer uh, a, a wide range of courses, and um, uh, it, it began with Ole Larson teaching two or three courses, uh, and then when the war came, uh, his sec he got his secretary to teach. He gave her his teaching notes and had her go out and teach. She later became a, a professor, <laughs> and. Uh, a, a, uh, uh, an academic figure in her own right. But um, it, Indiana was early to have a broad curriculum and to have the money to support a large number, hundreds of graduate students because they worked in the audiovisual center. They were cleaning films and mailing films and repairing films and booking films, evaluating films. Um, doing sales work at conventions, uh, producing films, doing research on film production, you know, hundreds of graduate students. So uh, that created an, enough bodies to support a broad curriculum, lots of seats, a lot, a lot of butts in lots of seats. Thank you so much. That's a fabulous story, uh, amazing. Let me shift gears here a little bit to, uh, back to some of my questions. And this one is uh, uh, about a 30 second elevator speech or, or so. And it's uh, to give uh, our audience an example of how somebody might, might explain you know, what it is that they do. So I, I set this up usually saying, if you're at a neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor and they ask you, Mike, you know, what do you do? Or what did you do? Depending on what they know about you or not. But uh, how would you, uh, what's your short and sweet uh, an, uh, explanation of what it is that uh, you did? Yeah, I, I finally refined it down to this. Um, <clears throat> I teach how to help people learn faster, better, and cheaper. That's in a nutshell. That's what mm -hmm. instructional technology is, faster, better, and cheaper. Uh, and I take those challenges uh, seriously. Uh, I, I, I fear that, uh, you know, old timers always fear this. I fear that newcomers have lost uh, the cheaply part. I don't think there is a tremendous uh, urge to refine techniques uh, so that you can do more with less. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because what would have to be reduced, the, the cost that would have to be reduced in most cases is human labor. We're talking about uh, restructuring teachers' jobs. Um, and teachers and professors uh, and administrators aren't very interested in that. Now, corporate training uh, managers uh, and HRD uh, managers are very much interested in that. That's why most of our graduates went out into corporate education uh, because schools and universities aren't interested in doing the, the job teacher, a job cheaper. <laughs> they mm -hmm. have already invested their money in facilities. They've got teachers on the payroll. They're not gonna fire them. Uh, and to have them not teaching full-time to have them perform some specialized function along with the machine isn't going to be very fulfilling to them, or it's nor is it going to look good to our board of trustees. So we'll thank you very much. We'll do it the expensive way. 
but that's it faster better cheaper that uh, of course uh, that's a that's a challenge that uh, may be revisited someday in terms of how we must uh, change how we do all those things but yeah let me shift gears here again as a lifelong learner uh, where's your current focus or next focus for your own learning and are you working on on uh, learning and or writing anything uh, now or soon that you could share with us and and before we started, you asked me to remind you about TWI. Okay. And I and I think that fits in, in this uh, question. Right. Um, remind <coughs> me again, because I'm going to start somewhere else. Please. Uh, the, the main thing I'm working on is uh, follow up to the big book, okay. uh, the current book. Um, I, um, toward the end of the writing i started to get into the neuroscience literature um, of course it's neuroscience for dummies and not neuroscience for neuroscientists although i did i i, I took the articles that were translations for the layman and followed up on their references to find the original sources and so i really have read in a, what, in, a, in a superficial way, I have read the basic research uh, on neuroimaging. That's the big thing. Uh, with fMRI, uh, researchers, neuroscientists uh, are now able to see in real time, they're able to see all parts of the brain uh, light up and, and see learning uh, in concrete uh, imagery. Uh, I, I, I began to get into that, and there were some important insights uh, that got into the book, uh, mainly in the sense that what they were finding in, um, let's say, 2016, 17, 18, uh, was mainly confirming what we already knew from cognitive psychology. Uh, so that you know the the uh, the behavioral psychologist, the cognitive psychologist, the social learning theorist had all happened upon, you know, had made observations based on what they could see from the outside, and these observations were correct. Uh, that indeed, what was going on inside the brain was very much what they imagined. But you know, cognitive psychologists were always putting together more and more intricate models, you know, flow charts of you know, if, if the learner must have, or the brain must have a mechanism to filter this and to sort that and to classify that, because when we test people, they're able to do this and that, but not that. And so these outward observations turn out to be correct, but now we have visual proof. Of it. We can see those parts of the brain actually functioning. Uh, but since then, I've continued to uh, uh, study that literature, and it, it's becoming more and more revelatory, uh, telling us things we didn't know or, or we didn't fully grasp. Um, I'm reading things like, um, let's see. Oh, I have a stack in back of me here. Um, Dehane, how we learn live wired. The neuroscience of emotion, emotions, learning and the brain. Uh, all of these have come out very recently. And the common theme of all of them is that the whole brain, all parts of it, are active all the time. <laughs> uh, so that when we are studying, for example, reading a book, we are not just using our eye, you know, our, 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 our visual systems and our storage and retrieval, visual storage and retrieval systems, and of course, verbal, because we're reading words. So we're seeing pictures of words, visual and verbal. It's a very complicated process that goes on, you know, in deciphering the words into vocal words 
And so the vocal parts of the brain and the speech parts are activated. Uh, but it's not only that, uh, a feel, you know, kinesthetic sense, smell, you know, hearing, they're, they're, all, they're all turned on all the time. Uh, emotions, uh, there are emotional responses all the time. Uh, and all of these things are happening at once. Uh, so it, it, the, the block and arrow diagrams are, are way too simplistic to describe what's going on because everything is going on all the time. There's no part of the brain that is asleep at any time. Uh, some parts are busier than others, but all of them are awake all the time that we are awake. Uh, and they are contributing to what we perceive, uh, what we remember, what we store, and what we later retrieve. Um, so it, it's, it's a, um, a complex, um, it's a complex activity, but there are patterns to it. And, and again, you know, the, the, the value of the fMRI uh, and to the other technologies they have for, you know, kind of x-raying uh, the brain, uh, we, uh, we understand more clearly uh, how things are stored. For example, there are, we can see the myelin, the sheath on the um, dendrites. We can see this white sheath building up um, when particular skills are mastered. So for example, a violin player will have specific strengthened bonds for the fingers of the left hand that are absent in the fingers of the right hand uh, because they are fingering. And so that those muscles um, and the thoughts and emotions that accompany them are stored more permanently and more strongly. And you can see the strength of it. You can see the kind of, um, it's like muscles that are way out of proportion for those fingers in the brain. Uh, so we can see things now that we, we couldn't see before. And so we understand better uh, how the process works. And ultimately this will lead us, I think, to a better understanding of how to teach or how to, how to help people learn faster, better and cheaper if we understand better how they learn in the first place. So are you writing, uh, planning on writing a, a follow-up book or articles or? Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I will, you know, I'm my co-author and I haven't yet agreed on this. We need to have, after the pandemic is over, we need to get together and have a long session to talk about it because I have so many different kinds of things I'd like to do uh, and I'm not sure how they would um, all come out, but, um, I definitely want to do further work on the Elements of Instruction book, uh, volume two, that at least would incorporate the emerging knowledge about neuroscience, uh, but also get more into prescriptions. Uh, we, we really kept it light on prescriptions in, in the current book. It's more descriptive. What are the classifications? Uh, and getting that nailed down and selling that idea. Uh, and then there's not room in one book to, to do that and to give prescriptive advice on, on how to use all of this better. Uh, so th that that's one thing. Um, the other thing that was the TWI, um, I've been asked to write various kinds of historical retrospectives and most recently uh, in, uh, in trying to do a chapter on the history of instructional design and technology. Now I've written a history of instructional design and a history of educational technology, but not the two together. Um, there was a, a blank space in my knowledge base and that was in corporate training and military training uh, prior to World War II. That is not written about in the literature I read. 
uh, and I, I never studied vocational education. I'm sure it's very well covered there, but I never studied that. Uh, so I am now trying to inform myself about anything from that realm that we should be talking about in our realm. And what I came across was this movement called training within industry that came about through government initiative at when the United States was entering World War I. Uh, and it, it was reactivated for World War II. But in both wars, we were given the situation where uh, uh, we had to build our Navy up very quickly. In the case of World War II, the Air Force had to be built almost from scratch, um, as well as the munitions industry um, and all the other armaments. <clears throat> uh, this industry had to build, be built up quickly and the men who ordinarily worked in these industries were being drafted into the military. Uh, so how were you gonna run these industries without capable workers? Uh, and so TWI, Training Within Industry, was a movement subsidized by the government to bring together the best knowledge about industrial training uh, and to uh, train trainers uh, to go out into workplaces and take what they call green men uh, and make them competent workers as fast and as well as possible. Uh, and what, what I have been looking for is any theory, any pedagogical theory that was being sold by TWI. And it turns out that TWI still exists. I mean, it's kind of a trademark that's being used by some entities uh, to describe the work that they do. Um, and the core of their work is, um, uh, is based on the work of, um, oh, his last name was Alan, I think it's Charles Allen, um, who came up with a, uh, a formula, you could say, or it's really a, a complex system for designing and delivering uh, industrial training. And it was um, incorporated in the book. Let me see. Here, let me take a moment and remind myself. of the title and the author. Here it is. Um, the book is The Instructor, The Man, and the Job by Charles R. Allen. Um, <clears throat> this is a big fat book of 400 or so pages in which he goes into tremendous detail about each step in the process. Let's see, am I, um, let's see, am I still on the screen? Yes, you are. Okay, I'm not seeing myself. I knew that would happen if I switched. Um, let's see. Trying to recover image. There we are. Uh, so Charles Allen, um, he, um, an interesting thing is he uses no pedagogical terminology. He doesn't know that uh, terminology, but he talks about um, how to select uh, the green man, uh, how to prepare the green man for the training. Uh, the, the, uh, how to break down the task to be learned, how to sequence uh, the activities. Oh, and he, and he does refer to the learner all the way through. Uh, this is the one thing he says, you know, this is kind of a, uh, a novel technical term I'm gonna use, but uh, all of these people, whether they are, you know, tradesmen, technical men, green men, 
experience them. They're all learners. And so I'll, I'll call them learners to cover all the different kinds of people who need to be trained, male and female and so on. Although he always uses man um, as they did in those days. Um, but he talks to them about how to prepare the man, how to motivate the man, how to present. And then uh, he, he divides sort of the instructional uh, component from the, what he calls the training component, which is when they go on the job and they practice under supervision. Uh, so he gets into the practice, the supervision, the correction, the, you know, feedback. Of the, he doesn't use any of those terms. It's always using trade specific terms um, <coughs> and industrial trade terms. Uh, but in the course of the book, he describes all of the things that we talk about in instructional design, um, uh, but with a completely different vocabulary. Uh, you know, what I found is there's, there's probably nothing we know that he didn't know and nothing that he knew that we don't know, uh, but we were just speaking two different languages. And this was 1919, this book was published. Uh, and it was all there, everything you need to know to be a good corporate trainer, it was there. Um, now, T, the TWI movement went further than just the training and they actually got into OD. Uh, so they were talking about the training of supervisors, and the organization of the HRD organization, um, they understood. And again, they were way ahead of our time. They, they anticipated what Joe Harless would later discover uh, and Tom Gilbert in human competence, uh, things they would later discover. They understood pretty well back in World War I, World War II. And an interesting thing is after World War II, the army was demobilized and TWI was dismantled. It went away. But some of the advocates and experts went to Japan. Japan was rebuilding. They were faced with you know, shipbuilding, factory building, you know, and uh, manpower building. They were faced with the problems after the war that we were faced with during the war. And they were very interested in these ideas. And it was there in Japan, especially at Toyota, that the concept of Kaizen evolved and lean manufacturing and the concept of leanness or making processes simpler and incorporating uh, trainee input or uh, employee input. Um, those were visible in TWI, but they were, they were brought out and elaborated and enhanced and pursued very seriously in the Japanese setting, somewhat also in Europe where they were also rebuilding. Uh, so Europe and Japan, these ideas continued to ferment uh, and to have real world consequences and were later brought back to the US. So, uh, I'm now struggling with how to tell this story. Um, it, is, is TWI part of the history of instructional design and technology? In a way, it's, it's not because there is no direct cross fertilization. We never learn from what they taught us. We never read the book <laughs> that Charles <laughs> Allen wrote. Um, Volked, uh, as far as I know, didn't have much direct influence on ID or on ed tech. Um, so in that sense, they're not part of the history, but in the sense of the idea, the history of ideas, they were really pioneers in ideas that we later came to incorporate into our own vocabulary, into our own frame of reference. So what's this, where are you going to go with this? Is this a, just an article or is this a, a book? Or? Yeah, I, it, I, I'm writing two historical chapters for books. Uh -huh. uh, one book I'm a co-editor of, uh, and the other one I'm just an author of a chapter. Uh, but for both, I'm just trying to get my mind set in the right frame because I, I, I hate to put any sentence in print that I don't 
that I'm not committed to, that I don't fully, that I can't fully back up. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to say this was a historical influence, this was not a historical influence, unless I can verify it. Uh, so I want to track back the trail of ideas as, as clearly and as honestly uh, as I can. So that's where I am right now, just trying to get uh, the right mindset on this. Well, personally, I can't wait to see uh, what you produce because I think that that's, a, that's absolutely fascinating. Let me shift gears again here a bit. And uh, this next question has to do with our, our language, our terminology, the labels that we use, which I think is uh, something that uh, even when I first entered the business in 79, I would hear people like Rumler and Harless uh, complain about our language and it was sloppy and overlapping and just confusing, I think. And that's gotten nothing but worse in my view, which makes it tremendously difficult for new people coming into the field where they're having to contend, well, what's the difference between a job aid or what Rumler and Gilbert called guidance and Gloria Geary called electronic performance support. Um, and there's all the and now performance support and workflow learning and it's just a just this mess but so my my question is to you is there a performance improvement term or a phrase that you would like to define for us as perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued yeah. and you just want to put your spin on it so if you have one or more of these here I'd like yeah. like to hear them I, I have two and one of them I've already explained methods okay. um, and by the way, uh, the media part, um, I, I, I don't want to go into the, the formal definition, but it's basically what Clark was saying. You know, it's a delivery system. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I, I don't, when I talk about the materials um, that learners use that they're exposed to, whether it's a screen they're looking at or a book or a, you know, a film on a, on a big screen, um, I use the term resource to refer to that, not media. He's using media. To, no, he is using a resource, which is delivered through a media delivery system. But it's not the medium that he's using. He's using the end result, which I call a resource. It's words and pictures that learners take into their brains through their eyes and their ears, mainly. Um, so those are resources. I, so I guess that's the media and resource uh, confusion is something that I feel strongly about. Um, uh, so media resource method, uh, but the other uh, I, I learned about only because I was pursuing um, in for the book, I was pursuing a summary of what we know about human learning. I was trying to boil it down into half a chapter uh, to, to summarize the high points. And in the process of doing that, I encountered, of course, the, the traditional um, descriptions of different perspectives on human learning, the behaviorist, the cognitivist, constructivist, uh, and social learning, uh, Bandura's term. Um, and I, I was trying to characterize each of these as to the the kernels behind their differences. What you know, exactly how they did they disagree? What did they, where did they agree? Where did they disagree? And in the course of that, I came across uh, some neuroscience that showed, you know, through neuroimage imaging, it showed that some kinds of learning follow one neural pathway. Others follow a different neural pathway. And there were at least three of these. And so what I am now saying uh, and what I'm preaching is that we can't just talk about learning or learning theory uh, or learning design uh, or we can't just use the term learning because that term is an umbrella for several discrete kinds of neural processes. So uh, at, there are at least three that, that I take the time and effort to define. First, 
is the thing we're talking about most of the time that should be called instructed learning. It is learning that takes place through conscious effort. You know you're doing it. You're trying to do it. There is intermediation. Someone is helping you do it. Uh, and it is aimed at, a, at an objective. You're going somewhere. This lesson has a purpose. That's instructed learning. And it's largely uh, verbally based and stored verbally. Uh, and that constitutes most of what goes on in schools and, and colleges uh, and, and in the cognitive parts of corporate education. Uh, that's instructed learning. And that requires uh, you know, a certain procedure to be done successfully. Then you have spontaneous learning. This is the kind of learning that happens unconsciously without effort as part of our everyday experiences. And much of what we know how to do, you know, how to cook in the kitchen and how to uh, open uh, a package and, and, and use the ingredients in a recipe, most of that we learn how to do just through daily experience. Uh, we, we didn't consciously set out to learn how to do it. And so that's a, that comes in through a different pathway. And we, this has big consequences when we talk about K-12 schools, because right now there is a huge movement for what they call social and emotional learning. Uh, the part that was kind of lost during the era of, uh, of high stakes testing which emphasize math and, and reading skills primarily. Uh, so the social and emotional part, we have always thought was important, you know, developing a person into a, a citizen, uh, a, a good community member, someone who has compassion for others and works as uh, in a team and blah, blah, blah. Uh, this, can't, this has never been lost from schools, but it didn't appear in the curriculum plans. Uh, and so maybe it wasn't happening. It wasn't happening very efficiently, effectively, or affordably. <laughs> and so now people are talking about how do we how do we go back to that uh, social and emotional framework? Well, it turns out those skills, those uh, outcomes, are largely based on spontaneous learning. You don't teach someone how to be a team member. You put them in a team and let them. And let and give guidance to that team about how to be good team members and correct them when they're bad team members. But it's the experience, the everyday lived experience. It's the everyday. They learn democracy by going to a school that operates along democratic lines, where people's opinions matter, uh, where people have some say in the rules, uh, and where the rules are. Uh, regulated, uh, um, you know, self-regulated by the people because they, they buy into the system. That's how you learn democratic values. You don't teach it in the classroom. You don't set up, we're now going to have a course on citizenship. See, it doesn't work. <laughs> they learn it by doing. So if you want to encourage that kind of learning, you have to learn how spontaneous learning happens and how to encourage it. And then third, and this is maybe bigger than the other two, is Bandura's social learning theory. He discovered by observing primates, he observed uh, and then later confirmed with humans that primates and a few other animals with what we would call high intelligence are able to learn by observation. A monkey can watch another monkey using a stick you know, to retrieve a banana and they will pick up a stick and retrieve the banana. They don't have to be taught uh, and they don't have to practice it. They don't have to live the experience. They don't, it's not instructed learning. It's not spontaneous learning. It's purely observational. They see it once and they can do it. They don't have to practice it. They don't need reinforcement uh, and, and humans learn many of their certainly on the job skills 
They learn them through observation. Now, this is this is understood in some kinds of corporate education uh, where you uh, have learning by doing, uh, by, uh, by, or I should say learning by associating with others who know how to do, you know, watching role plays or uh, having an internship where you have a mentor, or someone you can shadow and you can see how they handle um, different kinds of problems, how they relate to people, how they handle meetings, uh, so the shadowing and, and role playing, that kind of thing, are learning by observation. And it's powerful and it's not necessarily verbal. It's not, it's not stored the same way instructed learning is stored. It's not retrieved the same way. You, you don't go through your memory and pick out the right words and put, or, you know, put labels on things. Uh, you just instinctively model or follow the behavior that was modeled by someone else. So behavior modeling is the big tool for uh, what I would call, uh, or, or what, what, what Bandura called social learning. Um, I haven't written this down yet, so I may eventually call it something like, I don't know, modeled learning or observational learning. That, that might be a better term than social learning. That doesn't social doesn't really capture the essence of it. Uh, maybe it should be observational. But anyway, there are at least these kinds, these three kinds that are huge and they're very different. Uh, and yet we, we tend to say, uh, you know, we, we tend to have this mindset of learning. Well, we've got learning objectives. Uh, let's start pursuing them. Let's you know, work up a lesson plan. Um, and, that, and that may not, uh, it, it, one of my favorite authors is Dave Merrill, as far as principles and instructor, he really understands cognitive psychology and he understands you know, lots of good prescriptions uh, for using cognitive psychology. But the one thing I don't think he appreciates is observational learning because he will, in his books, he will give you a complicated routine of sequencing instruction and you know, providing feedback and blah, 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 teaching people how to do things that anyone, let's say in a, in a, say a work setting, say a, a furniture store, wouldn't train a salesman by sitting him down and teaching him sales techniques. He would say, there's Guy. Guy knows how to sell furniture. Follow him ar around for a day. That's all you need to know. Yeah, and it works. <laughs> so um, treating all learning as though it, it were a classroom activity uh, gets you off on the wrong foot. Can, does this relate at all to, um, there's this thing that's been going on here for, I don't know, 10, 15 years about uh, the, a 70, 20, 10 model. Are you familiar with this? which is 70% uh, of what we learn is through trial and error or informal learning. 20% is social learning where you're talking and getting guidance or coaching or mentoring from somebody. And 10% is, is formal learning. This, is, this was based yeah. on uh, something that uh, was a study of uh, 260 some managers, you know, kind of, yeah. a, 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 I don't know how well that's been replicated and all that, but, uh, but so this, this, uh, uh, reference uh, guide, I, the numbers are problematic because, you know, how could anything end up in, in such round numbers as such? Right, 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 right. It seemed to me that, that part of this is that what they call the 20, the social learning, you're saying is actually bigger. It's the observational learning by, you know, watching somebody else do something and you don't need to be formally instructed and, and uh, prefaced with a learning objective and, you uh, uh, tapping into the prior knowledge, I just, you know, right. observe it and can do it. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the 70-20-10, but uh, I, I share your skepticism about putting numbers on this. But I think what that's saying is that what they have figured out um, is that the people who are capable and knowledgeable uh, tend to have different, uh, that, that capability tends to have different facets to it. You know, there's the cognitive, 
aspect to it, the social aspect to it, and there's the uh, let's see the the um, um, the overall um, fluency of behavior, uh, you might say. But you know, in a way, I think that's talking about the three kinds of learning. Mm -hmm. you know, all, we are all walking packages of these three kinds of learning. We all combine those three, and there are probably more, but there are at least these three different uh, identifiable and important kinds of learning that we are all the product of. And so if you look closely enough, you know, if we dissected our brains uh, to find out uh, how we got those capabilities, you would probably find that some of them came from instructed learning, uh, some came from spontaneous learning, some came from observational learning. Uh, that would surely be the result because we can see it on neuroimaging. We can see those three kinds of things happening all the time. Have you written anything up about these uh, three pathways no. yet? No, no. Is this coming? Is this another thing on your plate? You, you well, got this, plate. This, will, this will be part of the next volume for sure. Ah. It'll be the core of, of, of the next volume. Um, because so, got to so that's to take the, the various communication configurations and uh, uh, deciding which of these pathways is appropriate for them. For that, for examples, it, 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 there's not going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence, but I think sure. you'll see, for example, that um, study is an efficacious configuration for certain kinds of learning, mainly instructed learning, you know, verbally mm -hmm. based learning. Yeah. Um, whereas demonstration uh, is a good configuration for observational learning. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean either one is limited to that. And, and that, that's why, you know, I, I, I don't want to put these categories into a straitjacket. Right. Uh, but to show how each of these configurations uh, can be stretched, you know, how it's, it's especially good for this, but you can stretch it to do that. I mean, there, there are people who have learned um, amazing mental capabilities just by reading books uh, because they spend a lot of time thinking about what they have read mm -hmm. and probably writing like in a journal or a diary. Uh, they've been, you know, writing about their growing understanding about things or maybe even expressing it in poetry or writing a novel, uh, their understanding of human nature and what they're learning about what the human experience is uh, they're learning the, maybe by observation, but they're by expressing it, they're bringing it together into words, you know. So, you know, each, each of these configurations has uh, a sweet spot for certain kinds of objectives, but you can stretch it to, in, to incorporate others. Well, I'm, now I'm not looking. Now I'm looking forward to volume two of your book. Yeah, it'll it'll be even better. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't cracked open volume one yet, so I'm, I'm on the curve here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for that. That was this is this is fascinating. I'm, I I should have done one of these videos with you ten years ago, and we'd be doing the second or third video by now. Um, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't have known as much. I most of what I know now I've learned since retirement when I had. <laughs> the time to read the books I want to read, and not the ones go. I have to read. There you go. <laughs> well, let's see. So let me move on to my uh, second to last question. And that is, so we, we, you've mentioned names throughout this video. And uh, what I was what I was looking for, again, as a way to point our audience, especially new people coming into the, into the profession, uh, some of the people that influenced you, um, later on not necessarily initially but uh so i'm not sure where you know how far you should go back or or limit yourself i don't think that you should but but again we're trying to point our audience to uh people that they should be paying attention to books that they should be paying attention to uh articles that they should be paying attention to and uh and we don't want to overwhelm them uh, uh exceed their cognitive load capabilities but uh so yeah where, who would you point to as, as places for new people and people in their intermediate stages that, that, that they can still learn from? 
Well, uh, someone who's fairly easy to follow because he writes a lot um, is uh, Dick Clark, Richard Clark, University of Southern California. Uh, his thinking has developed a lot. He, he, he's not like you know, B.F. Skinner or Alfred Bandura who came up with a good idea and they flogged it for the rest of their lives. Uh, Clark you know, is a much more uh, eclectic thinker and his interests have moved on over the years uh, from media production to instructional design uh, to cognitive theory and then later to motivation and HPT. Uh, his work now is almost exclusively in HPT. Um, but um, he, uh, he, we recently exchanged some of our most recent thinking and he sent me the last article that he had written and had published. Uh, it was on the topic of unlearning. And this is something that we use in the Elements of Instruction book. In the last chapter, in the last paragraph, I'm saying, you know, all of what we say about instruction kind of assume that learners are a tabula rasa, a blank slate, and that they're just waiting to receive these inputs. But we now understand that their minds are filled with with uh, frameworks and templates and constructs. Um, and often the biggest job of education is tearing down what they currently think about a subject in order to replace it with something better. You know, you first have to unlearn before you can learn. Uh, what, you know, you're teaching the course on instructional design to some classroom teachers. They may all feel like they're experts on instruction. Uh, and yet they may have a whole set of blinders uh, that you have to remove in order for them to appreciate uh, the things you have to tell them. Uh, so unlearning, and, and, and I, as I was saying, the last paragraph of her book is that it may be that um, the work that was done on, um, what do you call it, uh, cognitive frameworks, um, I'm blanking now, but uh, the, the work, and that's not the correct technical term, but well, I'll tell you the correct technical term. I'll look at my last page. Um, Schema theory, Rummelhart, 1980. Schema, that we have schemata in our, in our minds, uh, mental sets about things that are, are real and throughout our lives, they tend to be reinforced. We, we remember and incorporate the things that fit into our schema, you know, where we, like a political identity, uh, you, you grab onto those things that fit with your schema and you reject the things that don't. Um, and, and they tend to be long lasting and, and, and quite uh, resistant to change. Uh, and often um, a more advanced learning requires changing those schemata. So unlearning may be one of the big challenges for the future. Something uh, other than Rummelhart, people haven't thought very much about. Uh, there's another great thinker, Diana Laurelard, who has written a book about university teaching. And she says, in essence, that university teaching is a dialogue meant to break down previously held belief systems and replace them with more useful ones, ones that correspond better with reality. So it's a great conversation uh, about changing your mindset. That's what a university education is supposed to be in essence. So I think uh, they're talking about the same thing that they need to unlearn before you can learn. And we have very little uh, literature or, or guidance on how to do the unlearning. And that's what uh, Clark is now thinking about and writing about. And, and I hope to 
interact with them. Maybe we can both learn something uh, from each other. Uh, so uh, Dick Clark is one of those who has continued to think. Another is Silasalam Tiagarajan, uh, Tiagi, um, who um, you know, came to Indiana as a student in ISD in the 1960s. And uh, very quickly, he was teaching courses on programmed instruction um, almost immediately. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, has, has continued to evolve from there. And I think is a very successful consultant. He's still going, still thinking, still being very productive, lots of clients. Uh, he has filled up many blogs uh, and, and free books and published books and ebooks. Uh, he's constantly churning out uh, ideas. And of course, he's, he, he mainly uh, operates as a contrarian. Uh, most of the time, he's, he's trying to uh, uh, tear down what is uh, uh, accepted wisdom on any given subject and say, no, that's nonsense. It's really more like this. Uh, and so he makes us uh, examine the uh, premises uh, that we build our, our practice on. Uh, so he has been a refreshing person to go to, frustrating sometimes, because sometimes he resists um, um, conventional wisdom that is actually correct. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we, we have our differences, but mainly uh, we, uh, I've learned a lot from him and, and he taught me the uh, a mantra that um, got me through my early consulting experiences uh, when I expressed some reluctance in do, do I really know enough uh, to tell others what to do and he said, uh, Mike, keep in mind that these people you are talking to are behaving randomly. <laughs> they know nothing about what they are doing. They are behaving randomly. Any way you can uh, put some order into their thinking will be a positive and they will appreciate it. <laughs> so that has been my guide. <laughs> it's sort of like imagining your audience as naked. You know, I walk into engagements thinking, these people are behaving randomly and I've got to straighten them out. Whether it's true or not, it, it, it gives me the confidence to plunge ahead into what is often uh, uncharted territory. <laughs> so Tiagi, Dick Clark, they've been personally um, influential in my thinking. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll just mention uh, two others, um, uh, Mark Twain and Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, to uh, fiction writers, uh, mainly, uh, who I think uh, more than uh, more than anyone in, 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 in for my taste, more than anyone understood under, understood human nature, uh, understood what was perennial uh, about the human experience, uh, and um, and took it all with a grain of salt. Um, you know, at Mark Twain, he, the way he said it was, uh, they say that man is God's noblest creation. I think I'll wait till all the evidence is in. <laughs> and and that, so uh, Twain and, and Vonnegut both approach humanity with a very skeptical eye. Um, I'm not sure these are animals that you would want to trust very far. Uh, they don't use their big brains very well, so watch out for them. Uh, so that, that's a perspective that has informed uh, my own philosophy of life. Uh, having read a, a good portion of, of, of some of their work, I, I would agree that those <laughs> so we should uh, remain ever skeptical and uh, more like Tiagi and being somewhat of a contrarian, exploring the other side to see where truth might lie. Uh, yeah. uh, I've, I've been a fan of Dick Clark's for uh, 30 years now, but uh, yeah, so th thank you for sharing uh, those with us. And I agree that that's the people coming into the field, people in the field should, uh, should be uh, well aware of their work.
Mike, thanks so much for agreeing to participate with me in this video interview. My final question for you is I'm looking for any parting words of wisdom or guidance uh, for our audience, especially those new to the field related to all things performance improvement. So what guidance would you share? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> something I always preached to students at Indiana University was, you don't belong in this field, whether it's instructional design or HPT, you don't belong in this field unless you get gratification out of seeing other people succeed. Um, you know, you can, you, you might be able to have your moment of fame, your moment of uh, wealth, uh, but the long-term gratification comes from helping other people and watching them experience success. If, if you can get gratification, if you do as a personality type, if you get gratification that way, then you're going to have a long and happy career in this field. If not, uh, you may not. Uh, you, you may find yourself in some niche or off on some by road, but you're not going to stay the course for a whole career unless you really get gratification from other people's success. And very true. Very true. Again, thanks. Thanks so much for spending the time with us today and sharing your, uh, your insights and wisdom. Have a great day. Thank you, you too. It was uh, totally a great pleasure. It's always, always fun to talk about yourself. <laughs> so, thank you for the opportunity. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.